To his enemies, the most dangerous man in Europe. To his admirers, the most brilliant spy there's ever been. He has been called the man in the shadows, the man with a thousand ears, the man of a million mysteries. At one time, he even had a price of nearly a billion dollars on his head. He has shunned being photographed and seldom appears in public save at night or wearing dark glasses. Reinhard Galen, super spy. At that time, Captain Reinhard Galen in Berlin in 1933, when we were together students in the German War Academy in Berlin. We belonged both to the same uh, class in the War Academy from October 33 to July 35. I remember that he was not a gay person. He was a very correct character. He was uh, reliable. He was very solid. And he was devoted to his job to be a good officer in the army. I know that uh, with the beginning of the war, he was a younger member of the fortifications department of the general staff. As such, he had to do with fortifications against the East when the Polish, fell, Polish campaign had been terminated and it was necessary for us to protect this new frontier towards the East. During the campaign in France, 1940, he was sent by General Holder as his liaison officer. He apparently had made such a lasting impression on General Holder that he chose him as his aide. But he remained in that position only for a short time before he entered the uh, most noble department of the army, the operations staff. In this capacity, he uh, had to do with the preparations against Russia on the southern wing. Galen's work in planning the German attack on Russia in June 1941 brought him to Hitler's notice. But when the Russian campaign began to go wrong for Hitler, in April 1942, he put Galen in charge of gathering information about Russia's war potential, something Hitler and the Nazis, surprisingly, had not bothered to do before launching their attack on Russia. Thereafter, until his break with Hitler in April 1945, Galen reported regularly on all matters to do with Russia's war effort, gathering his information from agents inside the Soviet Union, some inside the Kremlin itself, as well as from interrogating Russian prisoners of war, studying Russian documents, and observing frontline activity. but his reports were not always believed. And there is one particular scene on the 9th of January, just three days before the Russian offensive at Baranov, as the Vistula started, when a new report of uh, Galen's was put to Hitler by General Guderian, in which Galen among others said that the Russian infantry, infantry was 10 times as strong as the Germans, that the panzers were in a relation from, of 7 to 1, and the guns even of 20 to 1. Then Hitler went up once more 
and uh, said in Gudean's words, that's completely idiotic. You put that, the man who said that in a madhouse, whereupon Gudean said, then you put me there too. Galen was meticulous, insisting that every scrap of information be filed. By April 1945, his files were bulging, the envy of the Russians themselves. The information they contained had enabled Galen to warn Hitler of the disasters impending at Stalingrad and Kursk and Minsk. Warnings that, of course, went unheeded. He'd warned Hitler, too, of Germany's eventual defeat. But long before that defeat, Galen had determined not to let his files fall into Russian hands. He had another use for them. Four days before taking his final leave of Hitler, Galen, by now a general, ordered his staff to evacuate his files from their headquarters at Zosen, near Berlin, southwards to Bavaria, to the so-called Alpine Redoubt, centered around... From Spitzing, the Wehrmacht trucks carrying the files, filling more than 50 large steel cases, took the 10-mile-long forest road to Valep, near the Austrian border. They were aiming for Hinderlang, where some colleagues awaited them. But the roads to Hinderlang were blocked by advanced parties of American troops. So they turned more deeply into the mountains, until finally they reached a forest hut known locally as Aelan's Owl, meaning Misery Meadow. Here, Galen and the nine staff officers with him decided to stop and to bury the steel cases containing the files in six-foot-deep trenches that they dug around the hut. It was the day the Red Army finally broke into Berlin. Every morning, Galen and his aides climbed one of the nearby mountains to look for the approaching Americans, but none came. The Americans had, in fact, been ordered to give the Alpine Redoubt the miss for the moment and to concentrate on mopping up those German troops still resisting around Munich. On May the 1st came Radio Hamburg's announcement of Hitler's suicide and of his successors, Admiral Dönitz, decision to seek an armistice. But still, no Americans came anywhere near Misery Meadow. By May the 19th, with the war now over almost a fortnight, Galen felt he could wait no longer, but must seek out the Americans for himself. With four of his aides, he descended the valley, first to the inn at Zipfelwirt, where he spent an anxious few days communicating by shortwave radio with those of his colleagues left behind with the buried files. But he had learned that the Americans had set up a command post nearby at Fischhausen on Lake Schliersee, and that they were treating surrendering German generals with great respect. He decided to give himself up. But his first meeting with the Americans was an anti-climax, for the young Texan lieutenant merely took down his name and rank and ordered him to an officer prisoner of war camp at Miesbach, near Munich. Galen protested his importance, but to no avail with his young captors, who by then had taken prisoner several hundred top German officers and generals who had been holing out in the Bavarian Alps, and they were pretty blasé about it all. Galen had to cool his heels for several days more before being questioned again. This time, the young sergeant who interrogated him knew of him, and so Galen began to be passed up the Allied intelligence ladder. From Miesbach, he was sent to Augsburg, and from Augsburg to Wiesbaden. The processing of the prisoners, especially the top-ranking Nazis, was inevitably slow and laborious. That Galen was given any priority at all was due to one man, the United States Seventh Army's Chief of Intelligence, Colonel William Quinn. It was in Quinn that Galen first confided his scheme for buying his freedom with his files, 
though he wouldn't say straight away where he'd hidden them. Well, I think it was just a simple fact that he had an awful lot of beautiful cards in his hands. And they're the cards that we wanted to, to have. We wanted that intelligence. We wanted that background, that basis, because we had no such basis uh, up until that point uh, as it related to the Soviets. He had been very uh, far-seeing Galen because he, his, his uh, own cons uh, view was that sooner or later there'd be a clash between Russia and the West. And he felt that if he uh, kept uh, his officers who were knowledgeable about Russia and his documents uh, together, he could at one point approach the West uh, with the idea of asking him to take over this organization after the, uh, uh, the capitulation of Germany. We had such a paucity of resources as far as the Russians were concerned and here was Galen with this organization he had developed to cover the Soviet military and had been uh, effective, or at least uh, we assumed it had been effective in the fighting in the Eastern Front, reasonably effective. And uh, here was something in hand that uh, would take months, if not years, to duplicate, so why not use it? He uh, thought very carefully as to whether he should come to the British or the Americans, but he felt that the Americans under, would, in the end, understand the problems of Russia and so on uh, much better, and the Germans, much better than would uh, the countries, the other countries of the West, like Great Britain and France, for example. Galen was flown to Washington, to the Pentagon, in August 1945, along with three of his top aides. The Americans had dug up his files and were clearly delighted at what they contained. What's more, the Russians were now desperately searching for Galen, and since they'd found his headquarters empty of files, were beginning to suspect that something was afoot. Galen and his aides were housed down the Potomac from the Pentagon in well-furnished villas at Fort Hunt. To see to his every need, Galen was provided with an NCO butler and several white-jacketed orderlies. His metamorphosis from a wanted enemy to a courted ally had begun. Well, the Americans, I think, were taken by surprise by the Cold War. There was quite a big body of Americans who believed that when the war, World War II, was over, they and the Russians would uh, become buddies and would cooperate, uh, and that everything in the garden would be lovely. Well. It took a little time, I think, for them to realize, for the Americans to realize, that this was not so. We perhaps weren't as aware as a man like Winston Churchill of the fact that the Russians were going to be very difficult to live with at the end of the war. I think he was the first to recognize that uh, Stalin was out for the Soviet Union and only the Soviet Union and that the negotiations which had gone on in Moscow, Tehran, Yalta, and so on, was jockeying for power positions. The United States was almost diffident in some of those discussions because we felt that they really weren't too much our concern. We had never dealt in great degree with Eastern Europe before, and uh, I think President Roosevelt had confidence that Stalin would allow, quote, democratic, unquote, processes to take place. That autumn of 1945, the Soviet Union was the biggest military power on Earth. Already, a sinister Iron Curtain was descending across Europe and leaving not only half of Germany behind it, but also the Balkans and much of Central Europe. Red Army was rushing in to fill the power vacuum left in Europe by Hitler's defeat, whereas the British and Americans were demobilizing as fast as they could. Immediately upon the surrender of the Nazis in, in Europe, there was a 
immense get the boys home attitude that started in this country and they're brought home by everything that moved and I always liked the then chief of staff of the Army's comment uh, that it was not a demobilization, it was a rout. <laughs> Intelligence, particularly in the military services, is usually the first to go. And so why would we need an intelligence service in peacetime, which reflects more or less the U.S. attitude towards intelligence? Uh, we had existed for nearly 150 years without an intelligence service. Why did we need it now? To begin with, one must realize that the Americans during the war in Europe had been almost entirely dependent on the British for their intelligence. They really never developed anything of their, of their own. And consequently, uh, although they weren't critical of the British intelligence, they felt that really this should not happen again. And they must build up something of their own. So it was two years before we had a legislative intelligence service. But in the meantime, in January 1946, President Truman, by executive order, created the Central Intelligence Group, which was uh, a pooling together of representatives of all of the intelligence services, state, uh, Army, Navy, Air, uh, and others, ex-FBI people, which started to acquire some of these wartime organizations which the military were giving up. Specifically, uh, German military document section from the Army, the Washington Document Center of the Navy, which was concerned with Japanese documents, uh, the foreign broadcast unit of the army, which monitors open broadcasts, and these were then being let go by their organizations, and these were picked up by what eventually became CIA. When I learned about the conditions which Galen had put to the American G2 for uh, working for them, I was amazed that the Americans had been willing to agree to that, namely that he would be independent from any uh, checking of his personnel by any German authority or even by the American army, that he was free to develop his own politics and that he would get the payment, what he needed, and that he could operate east of the Iron Curtain, as it was called at the time, as he thought fit. Galen, in his best years as a man between 50 and 60, he had a very strong impact on, uh, uh, on uh, uh, every man, I would say, on everybody, and uh, his strong uh, ethic attitude as a Latter-day Prussian uh, convinced that he was uh, trustworthy, that, that he was uh, reliable, and he could offer a, a specialist's uh, knowledge. He wanted the position to be the advisor of the American army or the Western world on how to deal with the Russians. Daughter and a seat of the former House of Hesse. Although he'd promised Washington that he wouldn't employ any former members of the Gestapo or SS, Galen did in fact do so, albeit under aliases, and claiming, of course, that he was unaware of their true identity. In the headquarters there were perhaps some political officers who had served for a sta certain time at some Gestapo office, but no really political Gestapo men. They used Gestapo men as agents and for purposes of contacting. Under the bargain with the Americans, he was free to employ whoever, whomever he considered to be a workable uh, cooperator. I think I would describe it at that time as being a case of desperation for some good intelligence on the Soviet Union, because we were pretty devoid of intelligence. And To join up in a partner with a former immediate enemy was uh, something that had to be considered. Uh, it was considered, but we felt that the, uh, the fact that uh, we would, might have to take the risk of criticism was warranted by virtue of the dividend. It was a 
really a very serious crisis point as far as we were concerned of being able to develop an intelligence system inside the Soviet Union. German prisoners of war returning from Russia were a ready source of information for Galen. He saw to it that they were all interrogated thoroughly, and it was from the unusual stone with which one of the returning prisoners had fashioned a cigarette lighter while in Russian captivity that Galen was able to tell the Americans that the Russians had now discovered uranium and were no longer dependent on foreign supplies. It was from those Germans forced to leave their homes in the eastern zone that Galen recruited many of his agents. After suitable training, many of these DPs, displaced persons, were secreted back into the eastern zone. Galen shared their hatred of the Soviets. Galen's anti-communist, anti-socialism, I think must date from the war, really. Uh, and it's, I suppose, understandable. Here he was, a major general in a great and powerful army, being defeated by the Russians. Uh, he saw what he believed or was, was told was atrocities by the Russians. And um, he never really had a very high opinion of their military capabilities. He once uh, said to me that um, I, what was so very difficult to discern in the Russians was not their plans or their place of attack or something like that. It's, one never knew how many men they had. Uh, you'd kill a lot and yet more would come on. And so I think he that was another element in the problem. He was afraid of these Russians, and he felt sooner or later uh, that uh, uh, they'd overrun Germany and that Germany would be absorbed by Russia. I think he, was, he has never been able to reflect all his war experiences and, uh, and war uh, um, ideas of war into a a, a political um, a, um, shape. So he remained um, a, a soldier uh, living in the idea the foe, the enemy, must be kept under control and, if necessary, if, uh, be defeated. He's a crusader against communism. There's no, no, no doubt about that. But um, at times he would probably turn against the same way fanatically against the uh, government of Cairo or I don't know whatever it, it, it job was given to him. He's in a way is a pure professional officer who does the job he's given. The US Army camp at Oberursel near Frankfurt was Galen's first headquarters. His American patrons providing him with $600,000 a year which he was soon to up to nearly $20 million a year. His staff also grew, from less than 400 to more than 1,000. Oberursel became no longer big enough. In the autumn of 1947, the same autumn the CIA was established and Galen's organization transferred to it, he persuaded his American patrons to spend $3 million modernizing this former SS model housing estate at Pulach near Munich. Once Martin Bormann's headquarters, and before that Rudolf Hess's, its seclusion was a boon to Galen. He made it into the most up-to-date espionage center in the world. His family and the families of his staff were all moved within the compound and discouraged from ever venturing outside. A school for their children was established within the compound, and American-type shops providing American-type rations. This at a time when most Germans were on bare subsistence. Galen had only to ask, 
and the Americans, it seemed, were only too eager to provide. One would have to really uh, know a lot more to say whether the United States really did get value or not. I, I would say that without being cynical, that if we didn't get uh, value for it, it wasn't the only effort that we uh, wasted money on, because we were learning by experience, and occasionally the experience was not good. These were the years when Russia's NET was delivered at one international conference after another. And the face of this man, Vyashlav Molotov, came to symbolize every cooling of the Cold War. Every cooling of the Cold War, every hardening of Russia's attitude towards the West, made it easier for Galen to loosen America's purse strings. The late 1940s saw Russia dishonoring her promises concerning Hungary, Romania and Bulgaria, as she'd already done concerning Poland. The communists took over in Czechoslovakia, a communist-inspired civil war raged in Greece, and a communist state was formed in East Germany. Russia blockaded West Berlin and threatened Yugoslavia's independence. Moscow-backed parties looked like coming to power even in France and Italy. To the West, the Soviets were an enigma, and so the West became ever more hungry for information of the Soviets' intentions. I don't think Galen had any particularly new or novel methods of working. I think he had learned, however, one thing from his experience, namely that if uh, you are making an intelligence estimate, uh, then you've got to take all sources of information into uh, consideration. That includes what a spy may produce. I think in intelligence is just so much you can get by formal training, the rest has to be by experience. And of course, the British intelligence service being perhaps the oldest continuous service in history um, had had a great deal more of this experience which was passed on down the line. I think probably Galen found out what many people have found out before, that of the information available, uh, for, to make a report or an estimate. Probably four-fifths of that information comes from, oh, general sources, uh, newspapers, so on, and probably only one, say, one-fifth of it, if as much as that comes, shall we say, from secret agents or similar secret sources. Today, with modern intelligence collection, overhead reconnaissance satellite, photographic satellites, and the vast expansion of communications intelligence where you listen to every sound, uh, per perhaps you could go as high as 90 or 95. Certainly, four-fifths is a, a conservative estimate as how much comes from completely overt, easily obtainable, non-clandestine methods. Well, I... <laughs> I read, I've read one or two spy stories, and they never seem to me to have any uh, uh, real substance of truth. In what one must ask on oneself about a spy is not how he got the information, what were the ingenious methods adopted to procure it. What one's got to say is, what information did he get, and what use of it uh, was made when he got it. Galen set up some 60 schools for his agents at various Bavarian stately homes. This mansion of Amalienburg at Bad Visay was one. In all, he trained some 5,000 spies for work behind the Iron Curtain. One of their biggest early successes was in September 1948, when they learned Russia was arming the so-called East German People's Police. In the spring of 1949, Galen was also able to tell his CIA masters that the Russians had a new jet fighter, the MiG-15. But besides pushing spies into Eastern Europe, Galen was instrumental in encouraging the United States to set up Radio Free Europe near his Pulak headquarters. Radio, in fact, 
loomed large in Galen's activities. The 1950s saw a hot war confrontation in Korea and a communist witch hunt under Senator McCarthy in America. A newly elected President Eisenhower, and more especially his Secretary of State, John Foster Dulles, began to talk of liberating the captive peoples of Eastern Europe, talk that was in tune with Reinhard Galen's own political beliefs. These were also the years when West Berlin, with its direct access to the East, was the espionage capital of the world. More than 7,000 spies and informers were based here, most of them helping Galen earn his title of spy master of the Western world. Three quarters of the West's intelligence concerning the East came, it was said, from Galen. He even procured a copy of Khrushchev's secret denunciation of Stalin from the Soviet leader's own Kremlin office. And he helped unmask such Soviet agents as George Blake, Gordon Lonsdale, William Bassel, and the Krogers. In gratitude, the CIA, in 1956, gave him a quarter of a million Deutschmarks with which to buy for himself this house on Lake Starnberg, near Munich. With the establishment of the West German Federal Republic, the Americans had honoured their promise to Galen ten years before to hand over his organisation to the new regime. Galen, in effect, became head of the West German Secret Service. In this capacity, he had not so much uh, more to do, or not only to do with the Russians, but with all the interesting countries of the world, and with political questions too. But even then, as far as I know, he never went to Bonn, or was very seldom. He always had this man whom he sent there. I had uh, serve, uh, served um uh, in a side branch uh, of intelligence uh, uh, during the war, supervising uh, the Russian uh, 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 agent intelligence radio. So I knew from the war one man or the other who had uh, joined uh, the Galen service, and they uh, asked for contact uh, to Spiegel and me in order perhaps to, to get uh, some information in conversation or ask one or the other question. Uh, or, or uh, influence uh, Spiegel's attitude towards uh, Galen. And uh, I proposed uh, to them to do a cover story of uh, Spiegel, which uh, was a rather well-known uh, news magazine already then, because there had been uh, lots of wrong uh, information about Galen derived from British uh, publications, and uh, Galen's associates asked him, and he agreed that somebody who, as a former intelligence man, would be reliable and trustworthy, would do a cover story in the news magazine. So I met him. And the, the, circum the technical circumstances, well, um, uh, I, was, uh, I traveled to, to Munich and had to, to wait uh, in my car at uh, a certain point, and from there I was invited uh, to another car, and uh, we toured uh, through Munich, and after a while, the car stopped and another car and another man took me over and they took me into a small uh, street with a very small, small men's uh, little houses. And just in one of them, uh, um, uh, before one of them or at one of them, the, the car stopped and I was uh, um, led into the house and an elderly lady uh, who, as a legion, would have told, I suppose, uh, lived there as, an, as a widow or so. Uh, uh, um, uh, served me some coffee and uh, chatted with me and the man who accompanied me. And after a while, uh, the doctor, Dr. Schneider, appeared with his uh, darker glasses uh, and his uh, little hat and just how the very few photos which uh, exist from uh, the time then uh, show him. It was a very peculiar trait of Galen's, this uh, desire for secrecy. Um, he gave up his title of general, I think, 
and became her doctor, I think was one of the, uh, the, the titles he took. Uh, one never was told where his private uh, dwelling was and where he lived. Um, and if one uh, went to see him, you were never certain that he would be there. He tried to create such a, such a figure of uh, I don't know, James Bond, yes, dark glasses, never make a picture, he has a hat and so on. And I think that uh, the practice of intelligence service in the 20th century is quite different. He spoke in a low voice. He tended to wear uh, dark glasses always when one uh, spoke to him and met him. Uh, I would think that he was a very determined man. He, he was simple, like the German general staff trained officers are. They uh, see their objective very clearly and uh, uh, go for it. And I think uh, Galen was like that. He saw what he wanted and he go, went for it. He's a fanatic. A fanatic in his job, a fanatic in his personal life, and a fanatic in his attitude against me. Galen doesn't smoke, touch spirits, or eat meat. And the few friends he has are connected with his career. I've heard that he did at one time, want to, that uh, Galen did at one time, uh, want to become head of uh, NATO intelligence. Uh, I never uh, saw any... Uh, um, documents or uh, proposals and writing about it, but there may have been some. Uh, I would uh, think it would be very, it would have been very exceptional if he'd done it. Particularly the French would have opposed it, opposed it until the end, you know. It never would have agreed that Gail would have been put into that position. They were very dubious about Gail right from the beginning. He uh, claims uh, on many occasions to have given uh, exact notice to, the, to his uh, authorities, the German government, of what was likely to happen. And I think in Cuba was one. I think the uh, Six Days War was another. Um, Vietnam, I believe, was another. Korea, Korea I think, was another, and so on. Well, I, I can't, of course, say that's not true. I have no way of knowing. But I will say this about an intelligence officer. It is exceptional that he can ever give an exact timing or an exact date or an exact description of what is going to happen. What he can do, he can paint the circumstances, he can show what the options are or the likelihood of this or that happen. Besides Cuba and Korea, Vietnam and the Six-Day Israeli War, Galen also claimed to have foretold the 1953 uprising in East Berlin and the 1956 uprising in Hungary. He helped to, to establish a secret service for Nasser in Egypt. But when Nasser let himself be wooed by Moscow, Galen saw to it that Israeli agents were infiltrated into Cairo. But the 1950s also saw the first of the many disasters that were to hit Galen in the years to come. The celebrated telephone tunnel built between West and East Berlin and meant to tap the most secret conversations of the top East German leaders. Built at a cost of six million dollars to the CIA, it was betrayed in April 1956, after only nine months of operation, by one of Galen's own colleagues. Indeed, as the years went by, more and more East German agents were infiltrated into Galen's organization. We trained uh, agents for assignment in Germany. And this agent came under the identity of East Germans, refugee who crossed the borders, defected to Berlin. Yes, to West Berlin before the wall, Berlin Wall was built. And they were debriefed, usually by the Glen organization. And the interest story which were planted to these people became to be really interesting for this organization. A number of these people were hired 
1961, Heinz Felfer, one of Galen's top aides, who had worked for him for ten years, was discovered to be a Russian spy. It was disclosed too at his trial that he'd been a member of the SS and of the Hitler Youth. He destroyed right away his reputation, particularly in America, because I remember reading in the New York Times or Washington Post, today begins a trial in Karlsruhe, which destroys the reputation of a man who had been considered by, the, by American intelligence, CIA particularly, as the most efficient intelligence of the world. And we have spent millions or billions, as they say, for nothing, because the Soviets knew exactly as much as Galen. I was sure that there were some people working for the Russians, because Galen had taken on SS officers, been taken prisoner by the Russians, and they said, now, you'll be shot, or you go free to West Germany work for us. Mr. Galen accepted into his service a lot of his uh, World War II colleagues. Many of these colleagues were in the prisoners of camps for a long time. And uh, these people were under the tremendous pressure from uh, their masters in these camps. And uh, one cannot wonder that some of these people were broken, yes, and agreed with, with the future cooperation. Felfer betrayed nearly 100 of Galen's top agents in East Germany. Their show trials in the East led to much public criticism of Galen in the West, particularly when the paraphernalia of their spying was paraded before the East German television cameras. Galen looked round for friends in the West German press to take some of the pressure off him. The news magazine Der Spiegel was compiling a profile on the West German defense minister Franz Josef Strauss who was one of Galen's most fervent critics. Galen offered to help. But when the profile came out, Strauss realized its writers must have had access to confidential government papers. He suspected their source. But his methods of combating Der Spiegel were clumsy when they rebounded on him, forcing him to resign. Galen, for his part, was nearly arrested. And among those who were imprisoned and charged with high treason, was Der Spiegel's then managing editor, Hans Detlef Becker. The Spiegel affair was a lawsuit initiated uh, for alleged uh, betrayal of uh, state uh, secrets uh, in an article uh, to which Galen's uh, organization had uh, contributed uh, some information and on which it had uh, cooperated uh, in verifying certain uh, uh, data. Undoubtedly, this uh, lawsuit, if it had ever come uh, about, would have been uh, much uh, less spectacular uh, had there not been a political controversy about uh, Strauss's nuclear uh, policy smoldering between uh, Mr. Strauss on the one hand and the forces in uh, uh, the Bundeswehr command and the army command and in Galen's uh, organization on the other hand. Uh, uh, the fact that uh, the United States uh, supported Strauss's enemies um, uh, additionally um, affected his uh, position uh, towards uh, Galen's intelligence uh, service which had been uh, taken over then uh, uh, from American uh, ages um, by the German government. Um, Strauss uh, believed uh, in a conspiracy between officers, uh, Galen's organization, uh, and uh, Der Spiegel. Uh, this will explain the incomparably uh, spectacular course uh, taken by a relatively unimportant uh, press affair, which um, Britain would have been settled by a simple D notice. For Galen, the Spiegel affair was the beginning of the end. An enforced retirement was only avoided by a further cooling of the Cold War. 
but his fate was finally sealed by the so-called Picard case in the winter of 1967-68. Maurice Picard, a former security chief at the French Ministry of the Interior, was charged with supplying information to a foreign power, which at first everyone took to be Russia. But when it turned out that it was in fact West Germany, and that he was a spy for Galen and had collaborated with the Nazis during the war, the then West German Foreign Minister, Willy Brandt, insisted on Galen's retirement. But Galen had hardly retired before yet another scandal burst around him. In October 1968, a number of prominent people in West Germany, including Galen's former deputy and the man whom he had backed to succeed him, General Wendtland, died in mysterious circumstances. Officially, they had committed suicide, but others said they were summarily executed. After the invasion in 1968, I was a third man who defected from Czechoslovakia. In 68, defected two peoples. And one of these men was uh, closely related with the German department. And he knows what is going on in the Grand Service, and he revealed his story. In spite of that, he uh, still didn't reveal this story publicly. But in the headquarter, it was known that the deputy chief of the Galan organization, General Major General Wendland, died because he was revealed by this man. The same is a question of Admiral Litke. Yes. Both were Czech agents, these people. I don't know the other prominent suicide who uh, there were about uh, six or seven others suicide in in a period of a very short time. It's called Bloody October, yes, in Germany. Today, Galen lives in seclusion in his house on the banks of Lake Starnberg near Munich. The lake in which mad King Ludwig II of Bavaria drowned himself nearly a hundred years before. He too had seen himself as a savior of sorts. Thank you.